people in. I know this is a meal day, so families with little ones especially, it's kind of hard to come in, but we'll go ahead and start. Let me pray. Our Father and great God, we are so thankful for this time, and I ask now that you would minister to hearts, to those in this room, to those who may listen later, that you would minister to hearts as only you can do. Thank you so much for your word. Thank you for your love. Thank you for who you are, the glorious and sovereign, reigning, holy God. We pray and ask these things in the name of Christ, your Son. Amen. Okay, well, today I'm going to speak about the subject of revelation and inspiration. Revelation and inspiration of scriptures. And you may be wondering, okay, that's kind of random, but why teach on this subject? And I've written down a few reasons, basically, that I want to teach on this subject. One reason is I love this subject. I just love reading about and learning more and more about the, the whole aspect of revelation and inspiration. And over the past couple of years, it's been such a blessing to me. I'm hoping and feel like it would be a blessing to you too, just to hear this afresh or to maybe learn, learn about it for the first time. And secondly, we cannot overemphasize the importance of the Scriptures, can we? Of the Holy Scriptures, how vital they are to our, to our life as Christians for faith and practice and for the life of a true New Testament Christian church. The Scriptures are foundational. They are vital. And the third reason is that you know, a proper view of how we got the Scriptures will only help to defend us against heresy, against error, and it will also equip us for every good work, won't it? You see that? That twofold aspect, it's a defense, that it's like a fortress that the Scriptures are for us, and foundation, and an, it's an equipper. It, it arms you, it equips you with needed tools, or wisdom, or hope, whatever it may be, for for. Uh, every good work. That's what the scriptures say. And fourthly, there could be a lot of, of reasons for teaching on this subject, but fourthly for me, this is, this is my attempt to bring you a renewed and deepened love for God in realizing what He has done in His miraculous work of giving us this, this book, of giving us the scriptures, His written word. So let me just start off by, by acknowledging all, all mankind by nature, they want a word from another world, don't they? They want, they want some message from either another world or from a higher being. You see that throughout the history of the world. The heathens have their imaginations that they've, they've established of their gods. And, and in fact, one, one theologian, I think, wisely pointed out, he, he noted how Hundreds of the world's space scientists are spending vast sums of their nation's treasuries trying to make meaningful contact with, with rational beings from deep space. Now think about that. That's pretty profound. It's, it's, as he says, it's an extremely questionable undertaking for many reasons, but the insatiable desire... For, for, or a thirst for a word from another world drives them on. And to this point, as of today, it has yielded them nothing. Absolutely zero. Think of it, all the money they've spent of their nation's treasuries, all the equipment they've built, all the time they've spent in research, all that they've planned and done has produced over all these years, hundreds of them, not just one or two space scientists, hundreds of them, Guess what it's produced? Zero. They have not gotten that word from another world that they're wanting. And they won't get it, will they? And, and, but do you, do you acknowledge that too? I mean, do you ever wish or think in yourself, I wish God would just speak to me. Just speak to me. God, 
give me a word, just speak, say something to me, help me, speak to me? Or do you wish that he would let you in on precious promises that he'll never disregard concerning you? Or promises he'll never break towards you? Do you ever wish that he'd let you in on important hidden truths about who he is or why you're here or the whole purpose of life or where you came from and what will happen to you when you die? What's going to happen to this world when it comes to an end? Is there any reason I have for hope after this life? See, these are questions we do want, aren't they? And, and, and these are things that God would say, well, have you read my word? Because I have spoken and I am speaking to you and giving you these things, answering all these questions and more right here in the scriptures. That's where you'll get it. That's where you'll hear from me. That's where all mankind will hear from me right here. And, and so we see right there that God is the one who created language, isn't he? He created the mouth, he told Moses. He created language. And he created men and women in his image, didn't he? We are image bearers of God. We are language-speaking people. We're communicators. We speak literal truth to one another. And that's how God deals with us as well. He has spoken literal truth to us. And that's through the scriptures. And we, we think of how Hebrews 1, the very beginning, what does the writer of Hebrews say? That long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God has spoken. He, he spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. That's important to remember, isn't it? He has spoken, and he, he's spoken through the prophets, and in the last days, through his Son. And later in Hebrews, he said that the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Now, now, these three adjectives are, are very important if you think about them. Living, active, sharp. That's what God's Word is. You ever, you ever stop to consider God's Word is alive? It's living. It's alive. It isn't a dead, lifeless thing. It's living. Or what about that simple word, active? Ponder that word, active. It's alive and it's active. It's not, it's not, it takes action. It's not inactive. It doesn't just sit there. The Word of God takes action and goes to work doing what only it can do. It's sort of like a seed or a germ. Once it gets implanted into the ground or into its host, it goes to work doing what it does. You see? That's how God's word is. He promised, didn't he? He said, my word will not return to me void. It's active. It's living. And it also says it's sharp. Think about that word. It's sharp. And it described its sharpness. I mean, it's, it's saying it's not ineffective. And it's not harmless. It isn't. It is sharp. Piercing down into the very depths of who you are. Discerning your own heart. And the intentions of your soul. So that brings us to our topic here on, on the subject of revelation and inspiration. Revelation. Revelation. You ever think about that? What is revelation? I'm not talking about the book of Revelation. I'm talking about the theology or the doctrine of revelation itself. Well, revelation is the divine, supernatural act of God where he deliberately discloses an unknown and unknowable portion of his knowledge of himself and of his purpose for creation. You see that? It's supernatural. It's a work of God where he deliberately discloses an unknown and unknowable portion of his knowledge of himself and of his purpose for his creation. And this is the case in, in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament is revelation. You know, 
the, the primary Old Testament verb that expresses this idea of revelation is the word gala. I don't think I'm pronouncing it right in the Hebrew, but it's the word gala. And it occurs some 22 times. And the root meaning of this word gala appears to be nakedness. Nakedness. And when, it, when it's applied to revelation, it seems to suggest this removal of obstacles for perception. Obstacles to perception. You see? So it's, it's kind of a, an interesting picture. You, you, this idea of nakedness or obstacles. You, you remove the clothing, then the obstacles removed, and you, you have revelation. Or you have the veil of the curtain of the temple. It's blocking your view into something behind the veil. Let's say an inner, of, inner holy of holies. Once that veil's removed, you have the obstacle revealed. I mean, you have the object revealed. So it's, it's this removal. It's, this, it's the removal of an obstacle so that you can perceive what's there. And that's what revelation God's doing. In the Old Testament, too, it called the, the, the prophets, the, the writers of the Old Testament, seers. Remember? They're called seers. Those who see things. They see visions. God has shown them things. They say it over and over. You see Isaiah say it, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Amos, Micah, Habakkuk. They all say that. God showed me. I saw. They're seers. And it's revelation. It, he has removed an obstacle for them to see something vital and something important. And in the New Testament, the, the primary word groups are, for revelation are, are apocalypto, phaneru, and uh, epiphania. Now, apocalypto is to reveal, phaneru is to manifest, and epiphania means manifestation. So you see, in Revelation, we, God is revealing, he's manifesting, and uncovering for us divine spiritual realities and truths that we could never figure out on our own as human beings. We could never logically deduce these things. It had to be shown to us. It had to be revealed to us. And God does that in Revelation. And he does it with unshakable authority, doesn't he? And in the Old Testament, again, almost 4,000 times, the writers of, of the Old Testament would introduce their messages with words like, thus says the Lord, or the mouth of the Lord has spoken, or the Lord says, see, the Lord spoke. Hear the word of the Lord. Thus has the Lord shown me. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying. See, that's, that's them having and receiving the revelation. And, and God has revealed these things to them. And they are God's messengers speaking on his behalf. In, in fact, you can go further and say, God is speaking through them. Their mouths are his mouthpiece in speaking to us. And that comes through God's revelation. And in, in the Old Testament days, the, the word of God came to them in different ways. It came through theophanies. It came through vi dreams and visions. And these dreams and visions always accompanied and explained God's redemptive plan, what he was doing, what was going on. And, they, and these theophanies and dreams and visions, they all culminated in the Mosaic age when Moses started putting things down in writing, and in scripturation, we'll call it. That's when things started getting written. In fact, who was the first one to actually write scripture? When you want to render a guess? Uh, I heard it. Well, God was on the Ten Commandments. Remember on the stone, God wrote them down. <laughs> On the stone, as, as Moses said, on the tablets, God's the one who wrote them down. And at that point, Moses started writing. And, and he started the whole process of inscripturation, and then after him, the prophets did the same. The New Testament writers did the same as well. And then the New Testament, it's important to note, the New Testament's view of the Old Testament, they viewed it as Scripture. They did. They viewed it as a fixed and authoritative body of literature that was Scripture. And in the New Testament, they used and acknowledged words about the Old Testament, saying things like the law and the prophets, you know, Moses and the prophets, 
the law of Moses and the prophets and Psalms, the law, Jesus said in John 10, the scriptures, or the scripture, or the holy scriptures, as Paul said in Romans 1-2, and um, the oracles of God, Paul said in Romans 3-4. He called, uh, Stephen, in his sermon in Acts 7, in verse 38, called the scriptures the living oracles. And Paul, again, as he closed out his, his letter to the Romans, called them the prophetic scriptures. And into Timothy, in chapter, 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verse 15, Paul called them the sacred scriptures. So you see how even the New Testament writers and apostles viewed, Christ himself viewed the Old Testament as scripture, as holy, as, as God's word to men. And what about the New Testament, Revelation in the New Testament? It's basically the same thing. It's, it's the, the fact that God disclosed more truth through his apostles about himself and about the way of salvation and about the way of truth, about the way of eternal life. He made it known through his apostles the same way and in a fuller way, more complete way. You, you think of what Paul himself acknowledged in Galatians 1. He said, For I did not receive it, that's the gospel, I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. So they received it too by revelation. They weren't just really smart and figured these things out, did, did, were they? And Paul also said, you might turn with me here to this section in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I'll, I'll read verses 6 through 13. And while you're turning there, this, this, this section here, Professor Hodge, Charles Hodge, called this the, the most formal didactic passage in the whole Bible on the doctrines of revelation and inspiration. So if you just bracket 1 first, first Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 through 13, you'll at least have his input on that. So I won't expound on this much, but I want to just read it and set it before us. Paul says, yet among the mature, we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. Verse 10, these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also, no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart these, I'm sorry, we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. So you see that? These are secret, hidden. It's a secret and hidden wisdom of God that, he's, that we're seeing here. He, he describes this, his messages as that secret wisdom. See, what he's explaining, or what he's proclaiming to them, Paul is saying that, that no human eye has ever seen it. No human ear has ever heard this. No, no human mind has ever conceived this, but it's been revealed to us. It's come by revelation. God's revealed it. That's the gospel. And that's amazing, too, that we will not figure this out. The smartest of people can never come up with it. You know, that's what the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and 2 was. The wisdom of these eloquent rhetoricians, these eloquent speakers, and how they spoke. And Paul said, I didn't come, in, come to you with that kind of eloquence. I came to you with the gospel. 
for it's the wisdom of God. I desire to know nothing among you but Christ and him crucified. And then he acknowledged these things, it's a secret wisdom that God had to reveal to us. And, and Peter, Peter also acknowledged that You're in 2 Peter chapter 3 when he's talking about Paul's writings, even called them somewhat hard to understand or difficult to understand that the that uh, the unstable will twist, and the ignorant and unstable will twist to their own destruction. Peter, Peter acknowledges this wisdom was given to him in chapter 3, verse 15. He says, I mean, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him. See, he didn't come up with it. He wasn't smart enough. It wasn't out of his brilliance. It was a gift to him from God. And, and Paul acknowledged it, and Peter acknowledged it too. He has this revelation, a gift from God given to him. And, and he also compared it with other scriptures, didn't he? As the other scriptures. So you have an apostle, Peter, fully acknowledging Paul's his gift of revelation and his writings as scripture. Peter, Peter it was the same thing. Remember Jesus told him after he asked who I am, and he said, you're the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And what did, what did the Lord Jesus say? Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So it's, it's a consistent thing. This is, this is not a matter of IQ. It's a matter of, of God revealing himself. This was unknowable. He had to show us. He had to declare it. Well, what about natural revelation? There, there is natural revelation, isn't there? Or you may call it general revelation. Um. What about that? Well, it's real, and it's true, and God is speaking through that. But what is it? What's natural revelation? It's, it's basically the heavens declare the glory of God, don't they? The mountains and the rivers, the, the oceans, the animal life, the, the consistent seasons. Think of that. Summer, fall, winter, spring, consistent seasons going on. Storms. Humanity itself, mankind, the way we talk, the way we love each other, the way we interact, and these things are all natural revelations to us that there is a God. And not just that there's a God, but there's a glorious God. And based on this natural or general revelation, God has spoken so clearly that everyone is therefore accountable. They're accountable to him. Because what do they do, though? By nature, we suppress the truth, don't we? They know God, Paul said in Romans 1. And though they knew God, they did not honor him as God. But they, because of sin, they have suppressed the truth in unrighteousness. But that's, that's general revelation, basically. It's what nature can show you and does show you about God, about who he is, that he is real and he's glorious. And in special revelation, though, or saving revelation, God is, is giving us this saving knowledge about himself. General revelation can't do that and doesn't do that. But special revelation gives us a saving knowledge about God. And it also corrects our misconceptions about God and about who he is. Because you ultimately end up with the God of your own imagination. If, if you discard the scriptures, that's what you've got. It's just an imaginary God. But special revelation breaks down those walls and it clarifies who God is, that he's holy. And for example, by divine or special revelation, God, we learn that he exists in three persons. We learn that there's a trinity. And we learn that, that God is a father. He's always been a father, which implies what? He's always had a son. And this son is the one that he sent into the world to become a man, born of a virgin, to, to be our Savior, that, that the Father, out of his compassion and mercy and love, sent his son to be our Savior, the Savior for all who will believe in him. And then the third person of the Trinity, God sends to apply all this son has accomplished in his, in his life and in his sufferings and his death and in his resurrection. The Spirit's going in and applying it all to people. He's the one going in and regenerating hearts. He's the one that, that's moving in 
to, to baptize people into Christ. The Holy Spirit's the one who's comforting and counseling and convicting. And the Holy Spirit's the one who's, who's sealing them for the day of redemption. You see that? You could never know that. You could never learn or discern that by studying the stars or natural revelation. It had to be proclaimed to you by God himself to tell you these truths, and these truths that discern your heart, that they tell you you're, you're sinful and you need a Savior, and God's wrath is real. It's, all this comes from divine special revelation, and it's, it's his compassion to do that, to tell us that. So, special revelation, the gospel itself even, it must be revealed to us by God. It must come by revelation. It must be proclaimed and taught. And he does this right here through his word, through the scriptures. Special revelation alone can save the soul. That's, that's the bottom line of it. That's why people need the gospel. That's why we have missions. That's why we evangelize or teach or proclaim this, this saving message from God. And this, this too, this, this, I mean, I'm pointing here at the Bible because this is the special revelation. This is divine revelation. This alone is the bedrock of our faith, isn't it? It's the foundation. It really is. Because I mean, how else could we ever believe in the, in the Lord Jesus Christ if we don't have this? How could we know about the resurrection? How could we know any of that if it weren't written for us here? So it is the foundation. And it is what gives us validity for our faith. And it's what makes, gives us assurance that we're believing in the Lord Jesus Christ as presented here in the written word. So it has to be foundational. You can't remove this. You remove this and you do remove Christianity. And there's some false teaching going on right now on that. And it's not good. But this is the foundation. The inspired revelation of God is. That's the only way we can know him. And so that brings me to, to the second part. Well, you've been speaking a lot about revelation. What's inspiration? What's inspiration then? So there is a difference. I mean, the two go together, but there is, there is a distinction. Theologians love making distinctions. They're always... It's not exactly what that is, but it's this, they work together, you know, that kind of thing. It's great, though. I love it, but it's important. What's inspiration? Inspiration addresses the question of how. How did God give us his word? How did God bring about his revelation to us? So in a basic definition that a lot of the, the, the Reformed or, or good theologians I'll consistently say basically this. They say, Inspiration was a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit upon the minds of certain men which rendered them the organs of God for the infallible communication of his mind and will. So you see that? It's a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit upon the minds of certain men. Now, there is a distinction here. That's not the same thing as spiritual illumination. All believers experience spiritual illumination. Your, eye, your eyes are open. Your, your ears are open. You're illumined to the truth of the gospel. But that's not inspiration. Inspiration is a supernatural work in certain men which, which renders them the organ or the mouthpiece of God himself. And what they teach is infallible. It's accurate and it's true and it's unshakable. It really is the mind and words of God himself, that that's how we receive it, by inspiration. And 2 Peter 1, verse 21, is a good verse on this. He says, For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. See, that's inspiration. They were carried along by the Holy Spirit, and they spoke from God to us. And I, th I think it's important to point out, too, one the theologian wrote, you know, it's not Peter's intention to deny completely human volition or personality in the writing of Scripture. So he's not saying they're just robots. They're just writing. The Holy Spirit's in their ear saying, write, for God so loved, for God so loved the world. 
they were, that he gave. You see, it's not like that. He did use their personality. He did use their intellect. He did use their, their, the day they lived in. He used it all, their personhood and manhood, but it's still God who has inspired and moved and spoken. And it's, it's, it's saying that prophecy was never a man's decision about what he wanted to write, but rather the Holy Spirit's action in the prophet's life. That's what's the focus. And... It does indicate that all of the Old Testament prophecies are spoken from God. That is, they are God's own words. They really are. It's just profound. It's miraculous. And it's amazing. And our, our, our children's catechism says, who wrote the Bible? And the answer is, holy men who are taught by the Holy Spirit. That's it. Holy men who are taught by or moved by or carried along by the Holy Spirit. He, he moved upon and inspired these living, thinking, willing minds. You know, the minds of certain men, different men from different times and different cultures. He used them and, and, and inspired them as his organs, his mouthpiece, to communicate infallibly this, this inerrant truth. So what they said, God said. You can, you can count on it. If you open up to 1 Corinthians... Yeah, Paul wrote that, but it is God speaking. Think of what Paul himself said about this. He said in 1 Thessalonians 2.13, he said, And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. Think of that, his preaching, or his teaching, his writings. You know, he's telling the Thessalonians that they received it as what it really was. They didn't receive it as from men. Oh, this is from Paul, or, or this is from Peter. Wow, these, these are great men. Let's read what they wrote. When they read it, or when they heard the teaching, they acknowledged this is the word of God. This isn't just words of men. This is the word of God. And that's what, Pete, that's what Paul said here. You accepted it not as the word of man, but what it really is. It really is the word of God. And it's at work in you believers. So they're receiving it as the word of God. And this is the word of God. And it's at work in us. It's impacting us. It's affecting us. It's changing us. It's instructing us. You see, it's at work in us. It's the Word of God at work in us. It's not Paul's brilliance. It's, it's God himself through his Word. Like I said, it's living. It's active. It's sharp. It is. And that brings up another point on, on revelation and inspiration is this whole aspect of being God-breathed. The, the Greek word theanoustos. Theanoustos. God-breathed or breathed of God. And 2 Timothy 3.16 addresses this. It says that all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. So God is the one who, who created, like I said, and uses language and to communicate us. And he's spoken to us in this literal way. And it's a God-breathed way. And, and think of... Think, Pause for a second and think of just the compassion or the condescension, the condescension of God. You know what? Some, some of the kids may not know. Condescending. When this is beneath you, it really is. If, if, if someone's told to do a condescending thing, it's humbling. It's all, it could almost be insulting. This is beneath me. You're asking me to do what? Well, for God to speak to us is a condescension on his part to give us this truth, to let us in on these things, to tell us these things that can restore us to a right relationship to him. These things are important that we may know so, and that we may become children of God and joint heirs with his own son. And this is compassion and love embodied right here in these pages of God. We need to receive it that way. But Theonustos, God breathed. Now, 
I've not read all that he wrote, but Benjamin Warfield, B.B. Warfield, back in the days of Princeton Theological Seminary, when it was a good seminary, when Professor Hodge and others were there, even J. Gresham Machen was there until he had to leave because it got so liberal. But anyway, Benjamin Warfield, apparently after extensive research, he concluded that God breathed the scriptures out from himself. That's it. God breathed the scriptures out from himself. And apparently, his, Warfield's conclusion has, has generally carried the field of scholarly opinion even till today. And it, uh, his works on the inspiration of scripture are, are very, very good if you want to dig down deeper into this subject. I've only read snippets of it. But to get more solidified, you could read that. And Warfield also says that that what Theonustos says of Scripture is that it is breathed out by God. God breathed. And it's the product of the creative breath of God. You ever think about that when you read this? This is the product of the creative breath of God. In a word, what is declared by this fundamental passage is simply that the Scriptures are a divine product without any indication of how God has operated in producing them. It's breathed out by God. Now, think of, think of something, too. Now, I don't want to go off the deep end, so to speak, but think of even the Trinity, or the Trinitarian aspect of, of God in the beginning. What did he do to create? Spoke. And there, there's almost a triune aspect there. If you have... If you've got to speak, if, if, if I'm up here saying words, what has to happen? There has to be a mouth, but there has to be something else. Breath. Tongue, is that what you say? Yeah, the tongue's included with the mouth part. <laughs> there has to be that. There has to be breath. No one's going to say a word without breath. And then when the mouth and the breath produce a word, that, look at it, I mean, who do you have represented as the Word in Scripture? The Lord Jesus himself. He is the Word. Who's represented as the, as the wind of God or the breath of God? The Holy Spirit. And God spoke and created this creative aspect. It all ties in, doesn't it? I mean, it's profound. It's deep beyond measure. But Christ is the Word. The Holy Spirit's the breath. God the Father, he said he spoke, and he works in unison in, in all aspects of redemption. The Father, the Son, the Spirit, they have different roles in creation, in salvation, in all of it. And it's beautiful, isn't it? It's just profound and, and, and glorious. We, we bow to it. I, my kids keep trying to digest the whole aspect of the Trinity. and <laughs> Sometimes I'm just thinking... Hey, the Father's not the Son, the Son's not the Spirit, the Spirit's not the Father. And that's just how it is. But there's one God? Yeah, there's one God. There's not, not, not three gods, no. There's one God, he exists in three persons. And, and we wouldn't know that if the Bible didn't tell us that. But it's true, and it is foundational, it's vital, it's important. Well, think also, I mean, I have another verse here from Paul in 1 Corinthians 14. Verse 37, Paul says, If anyone thinks that he is a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge that what I'm writing to you is a command of the Lord. See that? This isn't my command. What I'm writing to you is a command from God. That's it. And you should acknowledge that. So when you read 1 Corinthians, you better acknowledge that. In 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter you know, he says that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. See that? Remember the prophets and also remember the commandment of the Lord that has come to you through your apostles. This is God's commandment, God's word. So God is the one. He's the one who is speaking, is giving revelation to needy human beings. And he does that in compassion. He does, it, uh, he does it perfectly, effectively. 
He knows how to do it. He knows how to get his message to you. And the Bible presents itself as that, as the word of God. Well, I hope you've noticed that there, there is a difference between revelation and inspiration, though they work together. And, and you can see the difference, as, as again, Charles Hodge, I found helpful here. He says there's two major differences. One, in the difference of a, on, on the object, and two, on the effect. So, think about this. The object of revelation is the communication of knowledge. The object of revelation is the communication of knowledge. Well, the object of inspiration is to a secure infallibility in the teaching. See that? And what about the effect? The effect of revelation was to ren render the recipient wiser. That's the effect of revelation. It renders the recipient wiser. And the effect of inspiration was to preserve him from error in teaching. See, I think that's, that's very helpful. Let's just take Peter as an example. The object of revelation to Peter is the communication of knowledge to Peter. Okay, he received that knowledge. Now, the object of inspiration to Peter is to secure Peter's teaching infallible. Okay, now what about the effect? The effect of revelation to Peter was to render Peter wiser. So he did get wiser, didn't he? And the effect of inspiration was to preserve Peter from error in teaching. Okay? hope that's clear. And this progressed throughout history. Revelation, it did. It progressed all throughout history. And it was a very organic progression, like, like a seed or a tree growing. You, from its very seed form up to the, the shoot of the branch, the root, the trunk growing, the branches it all over time grew into what it really is, the full tree. But because it's an organic progression like that, it's perfect at every phase. You see that? From the very beginning, the seed form, all the way through, it was still perfect. It was still right. It was still revelation to them. You know, the Lord Jesus said, you know, prophets and kings long to know what you know. And that's, that's amazing. But think of it, what, what the prophets did know, what they did receive, was, was by revelation. And it, it was perfect. It just wasn't as full and complete of revelation that we have now in the canon of Scripture. So, a question may come up, and probably should or does, but it's a vital question, and it's this. It's, how does one know it is God's Word? How does, how does a person know, how do they know that they know that this is God's word? And not, not some other religious literature, but this is God's word. How do we know that? Now, I think, personally, I think it's wise to start where the Lord Jesus started. And for one thing, he acknowledged it's God's word. But he also said another thing. He said, my sheep hear my voice, didn't he? My sheep know me. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. They will not follow another. And that is, a, that is a, a, an important aspect of knowing. It's, it's when you read these pages, you read the pages of this book, you're acknowledging, I'm hearing the voice of my, my, my shepherd, of my Savior, of my Lord. I, I'm, by grace, one, a person will acknowledge that this book is unlike any other book out there. No other book ministers to my heart. No other message ministers to my heart. This one does. No other book is, uh, feeds my soul. This does. You see, why? Because it's the shepherd himself speaking to you through this book. No other book can feed your soul. No other book can encourage us like this book. No other book can tell us the way of salvation. This one does. No, no other book gives us real wisdom and guidance in life. This one does. You see, you acknowledge it. The, this book alone gives me real hope. This book alone is what gives me real joy. And no other work of literature does that. Not Aristotle or Plato, not CNN, not anything, nothing 
does. You acknowledge by grace that this book is the word of God. It's the shepherd speaking to me. And that's what he meant. My sheep hear my voice. And you're going to hear it right here. It won't be some audible, oh, there he is. I heard it, finally. Been waiting for it. No, no, no. It's right here. This is where you will hear the shepherd's voice. The voice of Christ. The word himself is personified and it speaks here. And I think it's also important to note regarding that question. How do I know this is God's word? Well, we would say also that this word, the scriptures, are self-authenticating. They're self-authenticating. They authenticate themselves. The man, reason, logic, they don't authenticate this. And if you, don't, you don't deduce your way to the fact that finally I've done enough invest, investigating that I've concluded that this is the word of God. No. <laughs> you, you just bow to the fact that it, whether you investigate and come to that conclusion or not, it's still the word of God. It's self-authenticating. And it's self-authorizing. It's also self-defending. It's self-defending. I, I recall reading one time about Charles Spurgeon when he was asked, Mr. Spurgeon, how do you defend the scriptures? And he said, what? Defend the scriptures? I would sooner defend the lion. What's he saying? They don't need to be defended. They defend themselves quite adequately. <laughs> Very adequately. It's a lot like you know, the Lord Jesus himself. His apostles and his disciples, they didn't defend him. They couldn't, could they? But did he defend himself? Yeah, he did. Remember when the, those sent by the Pharisees went to arrest him and they came back empty-handed? What did they say? No, no man has ever spoken like that man. And, and those who knew him, they, they would say, isn't this the carpenter's son? Where did he get this power? Where did he get this authority? This authority, where did he get it? And they acknowledged that he had undeniable authority in his speaking. So it's the same thing. A person goes to arrest this, discard it, disprove it, do away with it. They're going to be the ones in the end looking dog-faced and looking the fool because that's what they are. You know, they, it's going to be just like in the days of Jesus. They got to the point where they just quit asking him questions because they kept, kept being exposed as fools, didn't they? They just quit. He, they're trying to trap him. They're trying and trying to disregard him. It's the same thing with the scriptures. You can't do it. It's, it's, it's beyond you. It will defend itself. And another answer to the question, how do I know this is God's word? Well, the Holy Spirit alone can make it real to you. That's a fact. The Holy Spirit alone can make it real. And the Westminster Confession is beautiful on this, this aspect. It says, now bear with me a second. I know you've been listening for a while. But it says the Westminster Confession is chapter 1.5. It says, we may be moved and induced by the testimony of the church to a high and reverent esteem of the Holy Scripture. And that's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> that's what the, the church is trying to do, is to induce you to a high view of this. That's all I can do. And, and to the heavenliness, the heavenliness of the matter, the, the efficacy of the doctrine, the majesty of the style, the consent of all the parts, the scope of the whole, which is to give all glory to God, the full discovery it makes of the only way of man's salvation, the many other incomparable excellencies, and the entire perfection thereof are arguments whereby it does abundantly evidence itself to be the word of God. Yet, notwithstanding, our full persuasion and assurance of the infallible truth and divine authority thereof is from the inward work of the Holy Spirit bearing witness by and with the word in our hearts. See that? As beautiful and majestic as it is, it still takes the Holy Spirit to make it real in your hearts. And there's no higher authority than this. There isn't. There's no appeal to a higher authority. 
not science, not history, not reason, not human intellect. Why? You think about that? Why is there no higher appeal to a higher authority? It's because the wisdom of the world is folly to God. The wisdom of the world is folly to God. That's what, that's what Paul said. That's what God said. And, and over against all human beings, everyone, the scriptures occupy a position that is so high that instead of subjecting itself to their criticism, what does it do? It judges them. It's so high and so lofty that it does not subject itself to, to man's criticisms. It doesn't. It judges them. It judges every thought and intention of the heart. You think you take this and you're going to criticize it and disregard it and trash it and just say it's an old, outdated, crusty book that does all this? Well, you know what it's doing to you? Something bigger. It's discerning the thoughts and intentions of your heart, and it's going to judge you, everyone. Hat tip to Herman Bovink on that thought. It was excellent, just awesome. And also consider the Bible, the Scriptures... The Word of God has its own agenda. It has its own objectives, its own agenda, and it doesn't bow to your agenda. You see, it doesn't. It, it does not satisfy even like an exact knowledge in the way we demand it from mathematics or chemistry or astronomy, things like that. It doesn't, it doesn't submit itself that way. Like the, it has, the scriptures have standards that may not be applied to it like that. So, well, you know, all, all this chemistry doesn't quite, you may find things that you may think don't add up that way, but, but you've got to realize the scriptures have a criteria of their own. And it requires an interpretation of its own. Okay? You, and it has a, per, that's, that's because it has an intention of its own. You see? And what's the intention ultimately? of the scriptures? What's its goal? That's, the, that's, a, that's an important question. What's the goal of this book? What's its intentions? It's to make mankind wise to salvation. That's its goal, and that's what it does, and that's what it's good at. That's what it's effective in, and that's what only it can, I mean, nothing else can do that. So, so the intention of the scriptures is no other than that it make us wise to salvation. That's why we have it. Praise the Lord for that. And think about the Lord Jesus and what he said regarding its permanence. He said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. They won't. Generation will come, generation will go. Smart guys will come, smart guys will go. But God's word will abide forever. And it will impact, it will feed, it will nourish all of God's people fully and perfectly. They'll break themselves on the rock, won't they? They won't destroy the rock. <clears throat> I remember Brother Mac years ago, years ago, back when we met at Brother Philip's house. This must have been 10 years ago or so when he taught on the subject of the Bible. And I'll never forget one phrase he said. He said that uh, if you have the Bible... You can stand up to an entire world that opposes you and say, you're wrong. That's, that's right, isn't it? I mean, in the right spirit and in the right way, you can tell the entire world that's against you, you're wrong. And you're wrong because of what this book says. That's why. Now, I remember at work, in my workplace, there's a guy I've talked to off and on about Christianity and the gospel, and he came to my desk one day. He had realized something, and he was sharing it with me. He said, you know, Jeff, I was, I was thinking, if our coworker, who's Hindu, another guy, who's, who's, he's Hindu, and he talks to him some, too. He said, I realized that if, if my coworker, if our coworker friend is right, then eventually everyone's going to be okay. And he said, but if you're right, some of us are in big trouble. And I, I said, that's, that's right. I said that you've, you've come to a good conclusion there. And that's, 
And, I, and by the way, I am right. And, and I didn't say it in an arrogant way, but I said I am right. And it's not because I'm smarter than our coworker. That's for sure. It's not that. The reason I'm right is because it's, it's written right here in God's word. That he's wrong. And someday he'll find out. And I hope he doesn't, but he will. And this, this, is the, this is God's word to mankind. And that we'll judge them. And there's also, there's a great story of J. Gresham Machen. You know that name? Um, he established Westminster Seminary. And John Murray, he brought him in, along with him. And others, just great brothers and theologians. Um, several of them that just formed a great body of teaching. That he was at Princeton for a long time. And... You know, I, I don't know if he knew Charles Hodge or if he had already died, but this is probably in the 1920s when the days of, of neo-orthodoxy were just like wildfire throughout Europe and other areas that these really brilliant theologians, I mean, Schleiermacher and Hegel and some of these other guys, that they're, they're starting to deny things like the virgin birth and even the resurrection and other things that were just foundational to Christianity. And Gresham Machen was in such a, like, almost a defeated position where he's so discouraged having dealt with these people for so long. And even in Princeton, as, as I recall, the story goes that he went home and read the book of Mark from start to finish. Just sat there and read it. And he closed it and said, it has to be true. You see, that is the word of God that spoke to that man's heart. And the scriptures make the, the simple person wise, don't, doesn't it? If, if the most simple person has this and takes it at his word by faith, he is wiser, he or she is wiser than the most brilliant intellect at the university who re rejects it as a crusty old book. Now that's, that is a fact. So that's all I have. I hope it's been an encouragement to you. We might, it's 10.45, but does any of you have a question? I might be able to answer one or something briefly, or I'll try. Anyone? Yeah, the def definition of revelation. I have revelation as the divine, supernatural act of God where he deliberately discloses an unknown an unknowable portion of his knowledge, his knowledge of himself and of his purpose for his creation. That's summary form. <laughs> you can expound on that and go deeper. That's Revelation. Well, amen. Let me close and we'll, we'll have a few minutes to get up and stretch and talk and get ready for worship time. Father, I pray for your blessing on this word. I pray for your grace to each one that's heard it. Thank you so much for the scriptures. Thank you for your compassion and love to give it to us. Thank you for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We love you and pray in his name. Amen.